like to call the meeting for the St. Mary's County Board of Education to order for Wednesday, October 28th, 2015. May I have a motion to move into executive session? I move the board enter into executive session for the purpose of personnel, collective bargaining or legal, property acquisition issues, and student issues under Maryland Local Government Code Article Section 9-512A, 1, 2, 6, and 10. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Back in an hour. Is just being difficult. Okay, I'd like to reconvene the meeting for the St. Mary's County Board of Education. Um, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Do a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Next up is uh, board reports. Ms. Sarita Lee. Thanks. Um, I'd like to give an update on the superintendent's uh, student advisory committee. The first meeting was held last week and students from all middle schools and high schools attended and formed teams based on their grade levels. As a whole group, um, we discussed the commitment statements presented by Mr. Smith, and then we broke out into groups based on uh, middle school and high school. And so in the middle school discussions, we talked about all things middle school, so what's working, what challenges exist, but then also what improvements could be made. And then the high school group, we talked about the uh, one lunch, the possibility of one lunch, and the logistics, how this would work, what questions that students had, um, what worked in the past, what hasn't been working, and the possibility for that to happen um, soon. And then together as a whole group again, we went over the student code of conduct and grading and how that this is affecting students every day. Um, so in conclusion, students expressed interest in meeting again to talk about more topics. At individual schools, there will be principal advisory committee meetings to discuss um, topic specific to that school, which will then be communicated back up to the county level. And then the use of a Google site to communicate with all of the students is additionally in place, so in between meetings, students can still um, contact each other. Um, I'd just like to give a thank you to the Colony Arts students for preparing lunch, and um, I look forward to working more with the advisory committee. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Mrs. Weaver. I attended the Spring Ridge Middle School evening celebration, and this is students that um, stay for an after school program. Um, each one of them showed off their talent, whether it was um, an art project, a poster project, a poem, PowerPoint slides. Um, we were also um, had had a wonderful uh, uh, thing at the uh, in the not the auditorium in the cafeteria with the dance troupe that was a group that of students that uh, gravitated you know towards uh, dancing versus like say drawing or you know doing some, a poem poetry and also the rhythm club um, it was a wonderful evening and mr newcamp he mm -hmm. is one of the coordinators for the program the after school program he's a teacher over at spring ridge he gave a presentation um, about uh, language and how we should be speaking with each other just you know you know just more positive um, and that goes a long way and also there's there's a student there's students on a waiting list for mentors um, that was also uh, told to me by one of the coordinators and and said that you know they, that these students are really wanting to do an after-school program but they have to wait for a mentor to step forward and to uh, you know help out so if you were thinking about mentoring head out to Spring Ridge they could certainly use your help okay. Thank you. uh, let's see um, 
At the last meeting, I spoke about the upcoming um, Teaming Up for Social Media presentation that they were going to hold at Margaret Brent. Mm -hmm. So with this being a Red Rib Ribbon Week um, and, you know, attempting to keep children off of drugs and a variety of other spirit activities that are happening at all the schools in support of that. Um, this was a, it was a very good presentation. There were representatives there from um, several of the carriers that I think um, opened up several parents' eyes, including mine, of um, different apps that you can use in order to track your child and what they are doing on the internet. Um, and then the evening concluded with um, a YouTube presentation, or several of them actually, that um, where a, a gentleman posed as a child predator in order to try and get the children out of the house. And they did this with the permission and in conjunction with the parents. So when the gentleman came to meet them at a playground or actually knocked on their door or told them to come out to the white van that's in the driveway, the parents were in the van, they were in the playground, and they were absolutely astounded that their children, I mean, one mother's like, I don't even think this is my daughter. I think you have the wrong address. I think it's the wrong child. And they jumped out from behind the, the seats in the van in these black masks. And um, the, so it was just, it was very enlightening because every parent thought, every parent thinks that their child's not going to do it, but very clearly there's evidence that they will. So um, I think it was a good lead into the Red Ribbon Week because um, it is another, another, you know, area out there that um, we didn't necessarily, we had as children in my generation, but not quite as, um, easily accessible as it is now through the internet and social media. Mm -hmm. So hats off again to Margaret Brent. Um, I think they did a very good job in identifying a need. Uh, they also talked a little bit about how um, bullying and items that are posted at night affect a child during the next school day, which I think is a whole other untapped area that we probably don't realize how much it does impact seeing something at nine o'clock at night on Instagram or, you know, whatever, and, you know, how that, that just affects, you know, your work during the next school day. And I think all of our administrators across the system probably spend a lot more time dealing with that than what anyone realizes, including uh, me as a parent. So I will once again thank them for doing that. Um, they, they truly are a second set of parents in our schools. So thank you very much. On to you, Mrs. Washington. Thank you. On Saturday, October 17th, a 5K walk was held to raise awareness, secure funding, and provide unity of purpose about the pain of childhood hunger in St. Mary's County. This event was sponsored in partnership with the Southern Maryland Food Bank, St. Mary's County Public Schools, and the United Way. The 5K walk began at Lexington Park Elementary School went down Willows Road and back to the school. I walked in the 5K event and won first place in my age division. <laughs> so I got a nice medal. <clears throat> Dr. Austin, principal at Lexington Park Elementary School, ran in the event. And here are some other people that participated. Jennifer Hollingsworth, Brenda DiCarlo, and our own Susie Fowler and Kathy Norton, and many more community and corporate volunteers. How did the 5K walk get started? The 5K was started last year by a senior at Choptacon High School, Christy Norton. She is the daughter of Kathy Norton, now principal at Choptacon High School, and previously principal, yeah, assistant principal, and previously principal at Park Hall Elementary School. Christy is now a freshman at North Carolina State studying engineering. I asked what motivated Christy to start the 5K walk. I was told it hurt her beyond measure, and she could not imagine that students were hungry on the weekend when resources like free or reduced breakfast and lunch programs are not available. So she decided to do something about it, and I'm so proud of her. During Christie's first 5K walk for the Snack Sack program, she raised a total of $2,100, which went directly to the program. Since Christie is away at college, a student at Great Mills High School, Jack Aaron, has since taken over the 5K Snack Sack program. He is the student rep. Zach encouraged the Great Mills High School cross-country team 
to participate and he got corporate sponsors to provide t-shirts and other incidentals. And here are the t-shirts. And I represented the board at the snack sack 5K <laughs> walk run. That is a tongue twister. So since they know the board support this endeavor, they gave me a t-shirt for each of the board members, including the superintendent, and we well, have tiny you. people up here. And so <laughs> one, I got the smallest size possible, and Mr. Smith, you so got a be. larger size. Oh, uh, let's see. Tactfully handled. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You got, yeah. We won't unfold it. <laughs> nice. All right, so everybody has a T-shirt. Okay, this year's <laughs> Zach Efforts and Community Support, um, support he raised $2,300, so that is very good. So you may have some questions. How does the program work in the schools? Schools identify children living in crisis, receive parent permission, and then gather information such as allergies and the number of siblings. Once the information is received, the snack sack is filled with 22 ready-to-eat, kid and allergy-friendly, nutritious meals and snacks in an unmarked bag. The sacks are discreetly distributed to the students to keep their identity private. The sacks are delivered to the school weekly and handed out on the last day before a weekend or holiday break. So what's in the snack? The snack sack. <laughs> <laughs> you can laugh because I can laugh at myself. Granola bars, canned tuna, peanut butter crackers, popcorn, juice, cereals, mac and cheese, pretzels, canned ravioli, spaghetti and meatballs, fruit cups with peaches, pineapples, or mixed fruit. Sounds pretty good. How long has the snack sack program been in existence? Five years. How much food has been given to students and how many students? 48,576 meals and 156,288 snack items to seven schools in St. Mary's County. Currently, 120 students are being fed, but there are many on the wait list. How much does it cost to feed these students? The cost per child is $9.25 a week times 16 students from each school at 32 weeks. Each school, it costs $4,800 a year for 32 school weeks. There are still students who need food. And when I think about it, my stomach get tied, tied in knots and I was eating and I could not finish eating when I got those results. And what are students who are fed by the program saying? A fourth grader, it's a big deal because it puts food in my stomach. A second grader, I like it because sometimes we don't have food in the house. Another second grader, I like it because I get to share with my baby brother and sister and mother. I would miss it if I did not have it. The most important question of all is what can we do to help? One, through payroll deduction to the United Way, all money for the Snack Sack program stays in St. Mary's County. You could take five or ten dollars out of your paycheck and believe me, you would not miss it at all because it's gonna help a hungry child. And I participate in the program, and I know some of our board members participate through payroll deduction so that a student will be fed. I just could not feel well at all eating, knowing it's a student out there that's hungry. Number two, businesses can sponsor a school for $4,000 a week for 30 weeks for 15 children. $4,000. Three individuals can sponsor a child for $300 a year. Four business clubs or organizations can sponsor a food drive. And five, you can volunteer your time, your money, or your energy to ease the pain of hunger for children. 
Think about innocent, hungry children the next time you eat a meal. Every child should have the right to clean, healthy food to promote learning, growth, and potential. St. Mary's County is a giving, loving, and caring community, and I believe every school in our county will be adopted so children will not go hungry during the weekend. You can call uh, the um, United Way, tell them you're interested in the Snack Sack program at 301-274-0695, Post Office Box 613, Hughesville, Maryland. So you can start um, something at your job where you can help to make sure students are fed and we don't have hungry students in St. Mary's County. Thank you so much. It was a fun event and our students are brilliant. Our students started this idea of raising this money and we had another student that take it off. So community service is important to our students as well as character development. So not only are we t teaching them what's in books, we teaching them also to be good human beings who give back to the community and step up to help where uh, a need is um, shown. So thank you so much. It was a fun event. I, I think Susie Fowler actually was responsible for, um, st for starting that program when she was principal at Lexington Park Elementary and when she was um, chair of uh, the United Way. She keeps coming back. Yes, she does. It's a wonderful program. It's one of many we offer um, that allows <coughs> students to be fed. Um, I attended the um, National Honor Society induction at Choptagon High School recently. Um, uh, Commissioner Jarbo was there with us, and um, congratulations to the 28 students who were inducted into the society. Uh, it is um, not just grades, it, it, there's a, um, a number of pillars that they have to um, meet in order to. Uh, service being to, one of them. Mm -hmm, service. So, all, um, absolutely. so um, congratulations to all the students and to the teachers there as well. Thank you. All right, well, I've got a, you're, you're I've got a little bit here in that uh, I've been uh, busy out in schools and uh, seeing teachers doing just fantastic work. Uh, Thursday of last week, um, I had the pleasure of going to Miss Kristen Caton's seventh grade math class at Leonardtown Middle School, uh, doing an observation with uh, Miss Lisa Bachner, the principal. Um, it, was, it was incredible. Uh, what we really saw, if you'll remember back to the last board meeting, um, uh, Mr. Alex Jeffers, the supervisor of math, was talking about um, these agile ability groups in each one of the math classes where you flexibly kind of put kids together based on their understanding of a particular topic. Um, and this is exactly what she was doing. She had divided her room into three different groups and she was working with each. It was really, an, it, was an, it was an incredible thing to see. Um, of course, we had the Superintendent Student Advisory Council, and that was great. About 85 kids showed up, and they were really, they were really eager to share, and that's great. And we're going to capture that, and we're going to work throughout the entire year with them. Um, also related to that, the and and uh, Miss Lee alluded to it. The kids go back to their schools, and they're they have now got a position of leadership to talk to. The, the, the principal and the assistant principal and, and talk about what we were doing and at Margaret Brent in particular that student advisory group went back and they were talking about Red Ribbon Week and um, as I was there today observing a class uh, they've done a door decorating contest <laughs> for Red Ribbon Week shut the door on drugs um, and then of course they've incorporated a Halloween theme it's something take a little walk around it's something really quite to see um, on Wednesday of last week, I got to go down to Great Mills High School with Miss Wendy Tarr, the supervisor of world languages, and uh, we visited three classes. We started in Miss Sandra Flowers' ESOL class, where we saw all of these children speaking five different languages as they came in, and they were using, it was multimodal learning. They were using iPads, they were using just paper or pencil, they were using a laptop, and they were also then using an interactive whiteboard to work on their vocabulary building skills. It was great. We rolled over into Miss Eva Donahue's class, who's been teaching Spanish 3 for a, a good amount of time. 
Um, you would never know it to see her in that she is so exceptionally enthusiastic with her kids. They were all using laptop computers and they were accessing uh, the, um, the program uh, called iCulture. And mm -hmm. if you remember last year when we did the adoption of the world languages in the Spanish, um, they talked about iCulture and how it is a, it's a gathering of um, really relevant topics in Spanish and then sharing it with the class they were doing, of course, the Day of the Dead. Um, in reference in, with Halloween. We uh, finished it with Miss Sarah Orvec Spanish 2 class as they were discussing Gabriel Garcia Marquez. If you haven't read Gabriel Garcia Marquez, go out and read Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, fantastic. Um, it ch changed your life. Uh, and, so, and so just today we were uh, in uh, Margaret Brent in uh, Deb Orgel's um, eighth grade math class and we were doing Pythagorean theorem and that was fun, A squared, B squared equals C squared, um, kind of joggering all that old memory. What was really incredible about uh, Ms. Orgel is that um, she was at Evergreen Elementary School as an elementary teacher, and she is so gifted and so brave, she's stepping up and went to, Leonard, to Margaret Brent Middle School, and she's teaching eighth grade math. And so, and she had them captivated. She read to them. She brought out a picture book just like we did when we were reading at, uh, at uh, Captain Walter Francis Duke, and she read, the book was, What's Your Angle, Pythagoras? Clever. Um, and the kids were really, they were engaged in the reading. It was, it was a really fantastic um, opportunity to see a really gifted teacher interact with kids. Um, I was there with Mr. Alex Jaffers as well as he was seeing agile ability groups in, in action. Um, the last thing I want to talk about today is data that was released yesterday at the state level. Let's see if it works. No. Oops. It should work. Doesn't want to work. Well, I might have to walk over. Sorry. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna go back to the microphone. So it was released uh, yesterday to the State Board of Education. They talked about um, park data, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but what they really talked about and that I was very excited about was the five-year graduation rate for the class of 2014. And specifically, they released then the, all for every one of the counties, their five-year graduation rate for the class of 2014 cohort. And here's where we are. St. Mary's County, 94.79% of our children in the class of 2014 graduated successfully with their peers. That is an 8.5% increase since we first started measuring it in 2010. And so if you want to applaud at this point, that would be the right time to do it. It's a fairly amazing accomplishment. Now, you will hear pundits say unpleasant or unflattering things about public school education. And it may be true about other public school systems. It's not true about St. Mary's County. St. Mary's County, we have incredibly gifted staff members working with incredibly motivated children, supported by incredibly supportive parents accomplishing incredible things. I thought I'd never see a date where we'd have a 95%, and I'm gonna round up to the significant digit, a 95% graduation rate. It is quite a testament to the work of people who care about kids and are committed to their success. What makes this even better, this is a delicious cake, but the sprinkles on top of the cake are how we're doing with our African American subgroup, where we, when we first measured it, we were 79%, and at last measurement, 92.6%, a double-digit increase over the time of measurement. So our African-American students at 92.61% for graduation rate compared to the overall group at 94.7. That is an incredible thing. And if we clap again. <laughs> For all those who may watch us on YouTube, thank you. Just thank you very much. Tell your friends, watch us on YouTube. Um, and that ends my report. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we will move directly into the recognitions. Mr. Jason Hayes. Mr. Hayes, not to step on, just want to make sure that everything's right for you. All right, come on.
There you go. Well, good evening, Board of Ed. Good evening. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are so fortunate to have an ongoing support of our community partners to enhance opportunities for our students. Northrop Grumman has been one of these longstanding partners who has provided financial support for our students to further their experiences in STEM fields. Over the summer, Northrop Grumman graciously made a donation to St. Mary's County Public Schools in the amount of $10,000 for robotics programs at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. Northrop Grumman's primary philanthropic interest is a focus on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, commonly known as STEM education, to inspire the next generation of scientists, engineers, and technicians. In keeping with Northrop Grumman's philanthropic interest, St. Mary, Mary, Mary's County Public Schools will use the funds to bolster already existing robotics programs at the elementary, middle, and high school levels and to start up new robotics programs primarily at the ed elementary levels. The goal is to, number one, increase students' exposure to STEM-related enrichment opportunities outside of the classroom, two, provide students with basic programming stills, skills, and number three, promote teamwork and enhance collaboration skills. Representing Northrop Grumman tonight is Mr. Scott Stewart. At this time, I would ask that he join me up front. Coming over there tonight, I was thinking this is the 10th year I've had the privilege of uh, standing before the board and presenting a check on behalf of Northrop Grumman. And I'd like to thank Jason for working very closely with us. It's, it's nice when you donate to a STEM activity and you actually are able to put together a plan and this plan is going to provide monies to support virtually all of the public schools, elementary, middle schools and high schools as Jen Jason mentioned. So. Thank you for the opportunity to work closely with you, and uh, we look forward to future support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the 2015 National Healthy School Hero Award winner, Dr. Andrew Roper, is our presenter. Before I start, uh, Mrs. Washington, I didn't catch the name of that 5K. <laughs> 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 I wondered if you'd mind repeating it. <laughs> uh, Snack. The Action for Healthy Kids Healthy School Hero Award recognizes parents, teachers, students, administrators, and school wellness experts who have come together to create healthier environments for our students. This year, across the country, only 13 awards were given. Uh, and they went to a cross-section of people, whether they were in education, food services, health departments. So to be chosen as an individual receiving this reward is quite an honor. Deborah Settle, physical education teacher at Town Creek Elementary School, was selected in recognition of her work to fight childhood obesity and to improve children's health and readiness to learn. I'd like Deborah to come forward at this time. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of Ms. Marie Hangidson, her principal. Good Thank you. Ms. Hangidson, come up also. Ms. Hangidson, would you like to join <laughs> us and be in the spotlight here? No, that's, yeah. that's it. No, okay. right, you, can't, you can't deny the request of an honoree. You're going to have to. I'm, yeah. I'm so, you have to. Thank you so much. For her entire career, Deb has been an advocate for student wellness and has sought to instill the importance of healthy lifestyle in her students. She is an outstanding physical educator 
has been resulted, sorry, that has resulted in her being named Maryland Education, uh, Physical Education Teacher of the Year in 2009, and Town Creek Elementary School being recognized as an honor roll school for physical education in the demonstration school uh, program in Maryland. Deb continually promotes physical activity through her involvement in the student walking and jogging club utilizing the Terrapin Trail at Town Creek Elementary School that she was instrumental in, in uh, having installed many years ago. She also has organized a Healthy Habits Day and Family Fitness Nights which help heighten community awareness. Through her instruction and presence in the lunchroom, she encourages students to choose healthy foods, reinforcing a partnership that exists with the University of Maryland Extension Program. The Refresh Program aims to integrate nutrition education into all subjects in the school. If you go to the Town Creek Elementary School website, you will see there is a healthy active kids calendar that uh, families can print out, and that encourages uh, students to log their physical activities and to actually check off days that they did not drink soda. Uh, Deb is a frequent participant in the school health council meetings and someone who's always willing to take on new challenges and uh, is always willing to give of her time. She regularly attends our state convention and her drive to continually learn and improve is an example to us all. The Action for Healthy Kids organization could not have chosen a more deserving recipient. So Deb, in recognition of, of uh, your achievement, we would like to present you with this certificate. Mm -hmm. something very quickly. I have a loud voice. I teach in a PE room, so I can talk above the microphone. No, but but um, the thing is, when we go to yeah, yeah. when we go to put it on YouTube, we can't hear you. So you, you have to actually. I'm sorry. Is it on? Oh, yeah. it is on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, this is a team effort. Ta the, the the staff, the community at Town Creek. Um, I just organize the activities. If I didn't have support of my principal and the community and the staff at Town Creek, we would never be able to do any of the things that we do there. So I'm very lucky to be there and have a good support staff helping me help kids. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could just stay a couple of moments afterwards, we'll get a picture all together. Okay. All right, Mrs. Kelly Hall has a presentation to the church without walls. And our technical assistant okay, superintendent okay. is going to <laughs> <laughs> you want to just stay over there <laughs> no, I took down I took down her presentation so I said I'd make sure that it, that it was up good evening good evening, good evening. Um, this recognition is for the Church Without Walls, um, which is at the Church Without Walls Outreach Ministries is their official title, which they're just fabulous, generous partners, and we have some pictures to show you. We're very fortunate tonight because we have Pastors Dennett Goodwin, Pastor Mary Goodwin, and their son, Pastor Dennett Goodwin Jr., who are here with us. Members of their congregation live in the more metropolitan area and they were not able to be here tonight. But So we have some pictures and then we'll get everything to them. So um, the Church Without Walls, they have been just fabulous partners with us. And when I say partners, I mean partner in the truest sense of the word. Financial partners, um, true helping hands, people partners as well. Um, they have donated to St. Mary's County Public Schools since 2013. And they start the year out, you can see, with all kinds of basic needs, new t-shirts, new underwear, new socks to get kids started, and there were many of them. Um, they have given monetary donations to these schools, and we need to add Park Hall Elementary as of today. <laughs> um, program donations, they've given additional monetary assistance to our shoe fund, $1,000 to the shoe fund last year to our Lunch and Learn Summer Meal Program. They wanted to help. They helped us by sending people in, but they also wanted to make sure that the adults were able to eat as well because we cover the, the children's lunches, and so they provided um, some financial assistance to help us with that. 
They've helped with our Head Start, much like the Snack Sacks, dinner to go, basket meals for families. This is Christmas with the Church Without Walls. All of that was absolutely donated to a number of schools, bicycles and baby dolls and all kinds of wonderful things for children that en enable them to have a really nice holiday and more. And then they connected us to a wonderful friend of the school system, James Brown, the sportscaster, who we now fondly call JB. He is a friend of the school system and he's been here on numerous occasions and he comes and he talks to the students about hard work and persistence and sports coming second to school, but a very close second, he, he did point out. Um, he inspired. He talked with our students in our Title I summer school about the, the value of hard work. And he also came back and he talked to our high school um, students that are studying at the Technical Center at broadcast journalism and really um, had a great time. He comes back all the time and when he can't come, he sends us some signed footballs that I get to raffle off. So he has been fabulous and he actually is, is um, considering sending us some football players when the season is over to talk with our students. So we're very excited about that possibility. And that would not have happened without the connection with, with Pastors Goodwin. Um, there is Pastor Dennett Goodwin Sr. Um, and I took that picture of him when he handed us a check. And that <laughs> just the amount of generosity that this organization has shared with us is unbelievable. Uh, Pastor Goodwin was here about two weeks ago. He asked me, what is it that you need? And I said, well, you know, I'd really like to get some graphing calculators for students whose families can't afford them. Done. Turned around and he came right back. So just unbelievable. So on behalf of St. Mary's County Public Schools, I want to say thank you to the Church Without Walls Outreach Ministry for your partnership, your friendship, your, your just continued generosity to our students. And um, I also want to thank you as we talked about food. Um, they have also given $1,000 for food pantries to Head Start and the Judy Centers. So they've just been amazing. So I want to thank you. And I believe Mr. Smith was going to help me do this certificate. So could I have all of you walk the red carpet? No cutting corners. I want you to come straight on up. <laughs> so, on behalf of St. Mary's County Public Schools, I have met you, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll have to let me know how that video came out. I will. All right. All right. And I wonder if you would like to say a few words. But really, it's a pleasure to know that we can help kids. That's what the church is all about. And so I just, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by the idea of we can be partners with you to make sure that our kids, all of our kids, get a chance to leave their homes and get a decent meal, clothes, shoes, where they can be prepared to learn. So we're looking at the whole kid. We have to take one part of it, and, and the board of education and the schools have to do the other part. Mm -hmm. But we have to prepare these kids, get their minds clear off of things they should not have to worry about so they can be educated. So on the behalf of Church Without Walls Outreach Ministry, we continue to have a, a strong partnership with y'all and make sure that just let us know what we can do. And anything we can do, we will definitely try to do it. Once that our partners find out and know that we have done this. Like I said, they're all in the metropolitan area. Um, none of them are in uh, St. Mary's, but they believe in what we are doing, so they will donate anything they can to help the kids. Thank you.
just uh, again, we're going to take a quick. I will gavel. Go ahead. Right, just but before we do, so <laughs> St. Mary's County is a is honestly it's an extremely special place. When we talk about the corporate partnerships and the people partnerships that we've had over multiple, multiple years. We look at the, our faith-based community and the way they come in and, and the Church Without Walls and the, and the giving that you do, it's, it's, it's exceptionally thoughtful. Um, when you're putting together the, the backpacks and you're putting things in it that you know children will really respond to and need, there's, there's, there really is, as, as Ms. Um, Hall referenced, you know, JB coming down here. It is inspirational. It really is. And, and we talk about Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Washington's walk and snack sacks. Snack sacks. Um, <laughs> these are all ways that we come out and we come together as a community. So I just, I, I, th I thank you so much. I thank Mr. Stewart. Um, everyone it really does make this a, a very, very special place to, to work and live. So thank you very much. And let's get some pictures taken. Okay. <laughs> Ten minute break. Fantastic. That's also very exciting. <laughs> All right, I'd like to reconvene the meeting. Uh, let's see. Public hearing again. Public comment. No public, no public comment. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next is Mr. Steve Witten and Mrs. Vicki Mayo on septic and grease pumping services. <laughs> Woohoo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I know. I know. Talk Mr. About fun things. So this evening, um, I hope I don't open up the wrong file first. And I did. Looking for your approval for a contract for septic and grease pumping services. Uh, some background information: the Department of Maintenance manages uh, sewage plants, septic systems, lift stations and grease traps throughout the school system. Annually, all grease traps are required to be pumped free of grease uh, four times a year, or we can do it on a modified schedule of once a year, and that's what we are currently doing. We have an agreement with um, MedCom. As needed, uh, we also have to pump sewage uh, from lift stations and plants and septic systems to facilitate repairs and affect proper operation. Unfortunately, during the summer months, as you know, children are at the school, so some of our septic tanks don't operate correctly without food. So um, sometimes we have to pump <laughs> more than good. others. <laughs> um, the annual, this is only going back to uh, 11. The cost in 11 is actually a little higher. That's how much we spent with that vendor, or the, that, the current vendor in 11. Before that, we were using three vendors, whoever had the best price at the time. Uh, annual historic is that. Staff estimates that the cost for sewage and grease pumping services will exceed 25, which requires board approval. Uh, procurement method was ITB um, follow, following board policy DJC and uh, annotated code 5 112. Uh, keep going. Yeah, sorry. Three bids were received, <laughs> one of which was rejected and not read aloud as it required bid submission forms and was not included in the bidder's response. The procurement coordinator and the director of maintenance recommend um, award of this contract to Lee Industries Incorporated of Huntingtown, Maryland. For a period of one year, effective November 1st, 2015, through October 31st of 16, for four and for four additional one-year uh, options to renew the contractor built in. Not guaranteed, but they're there if we can show you this. Recommended action um, to the board and here's the bid tab. Here's the name of the two contractors. The bids were submitted properly. This first section up here is for normal services, and the lower section is for emergency services, of course. The prices naturally are higher because we have to call them out in a pinch. And, um, do you have any questions about the procurement or the services provided, or how often, or? No questions, thank you. Mrs. Weaver. 
Thank you for the breakdown of all the information um, and also the, the PowerPoint slide with all the background information. I really appreciate that. And also for going out for a competitive bid so that the, that the money that is saved can go back into the classroom. And no questions. Thank you. I have nothing. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. I actually do have some questions. Um, is this the same company that's currently doing the work for us? Uh, or is Lee, it a different one? Lee Industries, yes, is mm -hmm. the current contract holder. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we do have experience with the bidder. Um, the, I noticed, I mean, the, the other company that bid, their bid came in basically more than double um, what uh, Lee Industries has done. So it's, it is heartening to know at least that they have been doing, performing the service for us up to now. Um, so there is a degree of confidence that they can continue to perform this service for the amount in the contract. The, um, the second bidder, Magnolia um, Plumbing, is from Washington, D.C., and um, they did compete for this contract last time, and they also had a copy of the current pricing for the contract that we're in right now before they submitted this bid, so um, they knew what the competition was like the last time we competed this. And um, for the price that we're being charged, proposed for this, um, how does that compare with the current contract we have? It's, it's slightly elevated. Okay. So they, they held, from my recollection, I wish I, I don't have it in front of me, my recollection is they held their price for four years the last time. Yes, the, well, the, the prices have pretty much remained constant. Um, <coughs> this, this vendor was competitively bid, this contract was competitively bid mm -hmm. five years ago. Right. And each year we've renewed and they have not asked for price adjustments, even though they are allowed to per their contract. Great. Thank you very much. You answered my questions. I appreciate it. With that, do I have a motion to approve this action item? I recommend that the Board of Education approve the contract award for ITB, St. Mary's County Public School, 2016 MSGP to Lee Industries Incorporated for the pumping and transporting of waste from, from sewage, septic, sludge, and grease trap tanks for St. Mary's County Public Schools and facilities at the prices shown on the bid tabulation on and as needed basis throughout the duration of the contract. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hartwick, energy efficiency at Margaret Brent Middle School. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Um, this is contract award for a energy efficient project at Margaret Brent Middle School. And to give you a little bit of background, uh, St. Mary's County Public Schools has really had a long history of energy conservation going back to the early 1990s was energy performance contracts to uh, an emphasis on highly efficient equipment and all the modernization to, to took place uh, in the later part of the 1990s uh, and were actually a precursor to a lot of the green technologies uh, that were incorporated into Evergreen Elementary School and Captain Walter Francis Duke Elementary School, which are both uh, lead gold schools. Uh, and a large part of that is the energy efficiency. Uh, I'll tell you, a couple of years ago, Johnson Controls, which is a big player in uh, energy performance contracts, um, uh, came to us and said, well, we think we can do more. And so we said, well, okay, take a look at, at some of these schools, and here's the data on our cost of, of energy per square foot. They came back and said, you know, we don't really think uh, we can do much with a energy performance contract. So that says a lot for the school system. But we kept on searching. Uh, in 2012, we got some supplemental funds from the state of Maryland. We used that, uh, those funds to retrofit 
a number of schools? Was there interior lighting, concentrating on high school gyms, where we both improved the quality of the lighting and, and providing that lighting at reduced cost? Uh, since 2014, we've concentrated on exterior lighting. Um, um, and primarily the, uh, the older parking lot lights, um, which have degraded over time uh, in terms of their light output. Um, and so um, Margaret Brent, if you award this contract tonight, will be the 13th school to receive um, uh, new LED parking lot lights. Uh, and that has resulted in $95,000 plus coming back from SMECO in terms of energy rebate, which we have turned back into this cycle. Uh, and out of Margaret Brent, uh, we've got a commitment from SMECO for a rebate of $6,400. So this particular project, this one project was advertised in eMaryland Marketplace on September 15th, and you can see the incredible uh, efficiency of eMaryland Marketplace in at least getting the notification out. 465 vendors and contractors were notified through that process. This is a small job. Our, our budget was estimated at $71,000, just to give you a context. Um, but five firms purchased plans and specification. Two firms submitted bids on October 2nd, 2015, and both bids were complete, responsive, and from responsible firms. So we included the bid tab. This is the bid tab. Um, you will see that Zapata Enterprises is the apparent low bidder at $61,000. <coughs> the basis of award is that price. We did ask, as part of the solicitation, that they provide a unit cost for per fixture, and that was the reason for that is well, if we missed a fixture, or if we want to, for some reason, delete a fixture, we've got the cost already established. We would like to also use the possibility of that unit price in the future, should funds become available to do a, a similar project probably at a smaller school. So that, that price is important for, for those two reasons. I apologize for the, for the uh, previous version of the bid tab as we were rushing to put the, the, the PowerPoint together. We transposed the, uh, the unit price, uh, but be clear that uh, Zapata had both the low uh, lump sum bid and they had the low unit price of $1,402. And I will say that $1,400 uh, um, uh, price is, is, is very competitive for all the schools that we've, we've done today. Uh, and you can see that all of the, uh, the documents that were required by uh, the bid documents uh, were provided, including the letter of surety and a sh uh, confirmation that the surety uh, meets uh, AM best uh, financial strengths of A minus or, or higher. In this case, they're, uh, for Zapata, they're A plus. So that's the bid tab. We gave you a quick financial summary. If we can look uh, at Zapata Enterprises again, the base bid of $61,000 uh, compared to Pitt Electric at $69,113. Um, the funds available for this project is just over $83,000, so if we take the construction. Uh, and then we would like to ask uh, your approval of a small construction contingency of $3,000 for all the projects that we've done to date, the, the change orders have been very low, but it's, it's always nice to have a little bit of cushion there. So that would mean a remaining balance of $19,000. So that, those funds might be available for another school, and that would probably do a small elementary school like Town Creek or White Marsh or Ridge. So we hope that all comes to fruition because it's, it's a good value. So a little bit more about Zapata Enterprises. They've done 10 of these uh, retrofits. They've done an outstanding job. 
few change orders, uh, and those change orders are mainly related to unforeseen conditions or s occasionally a, uh, our desire to add a, a fixture or two. Uh, so they've done a terrific job. They're based out of Port Tobacco, so they're local. They're also a certified MDOT uh, MBE firm. Uh, this is not a state project. It's a local project, but we still like to see MBE firm uh, participating. So this is our our recommended uh, motion to you tonight that you do award the uh, Margaret Brent project to Zapata Enterprises in the amount of 61000 You further authorize a construction contingency of 3000 and that you allow us to use the unit price per fixture of $1,420 as a basis uh, of proposals for from Zapata Enterprises if funds become available. So that's our motion, and glad to take your question. Ms. Lake? No questions. Thank you. Mrs. Weaver? Um, thank you for providing the bid tabulation in there and really what you're looking for. Um, one of the things that really stuck out at, to me was where it has sex offender certification. Yeah. And they're, they are there working at the school, the students are there, and I think that's very important. So I, I thought that was really good that you provided that information. It, it's a state law, of course, but right. I think it's important to have that in the bid document right. so they understand the level of scrutiny uh, and the, just what, their expect, what our expectations are, and they can price accordingly. So thank you for the comment. And also, um, as far as warranty or, like, what happens if you have difficulty with the lights, you yeah. know, for a certain period of time? Sure. Th these lights, uh, and I should have mentioned that, and I think I did in my write-up, uh, one, they use about half the energy of a traditional lamp. They have at least, at least three times the service life, and they are warranted for five years. All right, thank you. Um, I think um, it's, it, I thank you for all the information. Um, I think as, as we change the clocks on Sunday and go back into the, you know, where it's darker earlier, um, there's still a lot of activities at the elementary schools and middle schools and high schools throughout this time period. Um, and it having brighter lights which um, these will be in mm -hmm. a parking lot. Um, there's always parking challenges when you have after school events between the teachers and staff that are there, the parents and the participants. Um, I think it's some of them do get kind of dark and dreary in you know the November, December months. So um, I appreciate the fact that that we are doing this and that hopefully we will have funds to continue um, you know with some of the other schools. So thank you. Mrs. Washington. This is a wonderful project. The LED lights are more efficient. They have a longer shelf life, and they are warranted for five years, and we can use the energy rebates to retrofit our other schools. So this is a win-win situation. So I look forward to it being done at all the schools. Thank you. Mrs. Allen. Mr. Hartwick, once this is approved, uh, when do you anticipate this work would take place? You know, it takes about two months. Okay. Very good. That's all. Okay. Anyone else? And last words on lighting there? No. Okay. No, I, I, like, I like LED lights. Okay. All right. all right. Then may I have a motion for this action item, please? I move that the Board of Education approve the contract award for the Energy Efficiency Project at Margaret Brent Middle School to Zapata Enterprises Incorporated in the amount of $61,000 and further authorizes a construction contingency of $3,000. The board also approves the use of the unit price per fixture of $1,420 as the basis of proposals from Zapata Enterprises Incorporated if funds are available to retrofit additional schools. Do I have a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can just move right into your next one. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. Okay, um, board members, uh, tonight I, I bring this information uh, item to you tonight to talk about one, a construction procurement method and a particular construction delivery method 
that I would like to uh, consider, have you consider in the future. Um, I want to explain these concepts and take your questions, hear your concerns um, before we move forward. I, I don't want to spend the time with procurement and, and bring something to you that is, that, that is new, and that's particularly in the case of the construction delivery program that has come to be known as job order contracting. It's important to remember that these processes are really very specific to construction. You shouldn't expect these to be applied to services or commodities. Uh, I think that's an important distinction. But just by way of background, state-funded projects um, fall under the purview of the Board of Public Works. They're administered by the Public School Construction Program under COMAR 23.03. They're very specific. Uh, what we, our philosophy is, okay, the state has invested in these requirements. Let's be consistent as much uh, as is applicable to local projects. So we really like to use both processes, both requirements, um, uh, um, as seamlessly as, as we possibly can. So the, the multi-step procurement, that procurement method, is an approved method and it has very defined requirements under COMAR 23.03.03. And it's a process where the, a potential bidder submits a technical uh, offer, as it were, that, submit, that, that provides their qualification and supporting document in the first step of the procurement. We, we really, we want to, at the very beginning, establish a, uh, a responsive and responsible bidder before money is on the table. That, that means a lot. Uh, and it also gives you a community of people, of, of like contractors bidding the project. Um, the submission must be in accordance with the pre-qualification package that is prepared by us. So we prepare that package. The requirements are that the pre-qualification must establish criteria for evaluation. So the kinds of evaluations we use are K through 12 experience, their bonding capacity, their response time, their key personnel, uh, subcontractors that have K through 12 experience. Those are all the kinds of criteria that we establish. Uh, and we use a pass-fail system. We don't do a number system. We just say, yep, you hit that qualification. You have five projects of, of similar complexity. Uh, you're good. Uh, so I, I think that has served us uh, well. So only potential bidders that pass all the criteria are allowed to take the next step in the submission of their bids. And there will be a, a lag between the submission of their technical, our evaluation, uh, uh, and then the ability to submit prices. And this is a step, the process that we use very successfully at Captain Walter Francis Duke Elementary School and the limited renovation um, and addition at Spring Ridge Middle School. So I'm very pleased with that process. Now, this is new to us all. <laughs> new to us, but it's not new to the country. Starting in the 1980s, the, the military um, really was frustrated by what they saw as the disadvantages of the traditional, you design it, you bid it, you build it. It takes time to do all that. It results in a lot of bid protests, no question about it, especially at the federal level. Uh, and oftentimes it led to quality issues. So the job order contracting was started by the military, um, specifically the Navy, uh, uses the acronym of job order contracting. Uh, not to be outdone, the Air Force calls it SABER, which stands for Simplified Acquisition of Base Engineering Requirements. So yay, Air Force. <laughs> um, but the basic jock program, I will tell you, has been 
uh, adopted and adapted throughout the private and public sec sector, including many LEAs uh, in Maryland. There are national contracts out there that we could, you know, ride right now. Uh, I'm proposing a little different uh, approach. But the key is to understand that a job order contract is an indefinite quantity contract. This is open contract. And you initiate specific projects through specific scopes, uh, and they are required to utilize a fixed price uh, index of construction activities and tasks. So it's, it's all right there uh, for everyone to see. Uh, and then the contractor takes that information and applies a multiplier, okay? Um, so many agencies, some agencies, I should say, have gone so far as to create their own price index. That's a laborious job. Uh, th the real recognized leader in estimating and providing these price index is a company called RS Min, uh, and, and they're the most heavily utilized group uh, uh, that I know of. And so what I did was, this gets a little complicated, I'll, I'll admit that. Uh, I took a very simple example out of Ming to show you how this might work and how it might be applied to job order contracting. So this particular line item is for the construction of a partition wall, a wall that separates uh, an area, it's not a barren wall, for instance. And so that's, that's a general category, and then they have subcategories, and in this particular case it's using one-half gypsum board, uh, standard gypsum board, nothing special, tape and finished on two sides. That's the description of the, the construction activity that they're talking about. And then they have to get a little more refined because you might do it in wood studs or, you know, there, there are different materials that you could use. So in this case, what we commonly use are metal studs, 25 gauge, 16 inch on center. They're three and five eighths inches wide. So I have an entry for that. Um, then they kind of give you information about what uh, a crew size, output, and labor hours per unit. In this case, the unit is per square foot. So they're basically saying that it takes 0.48 labor hours uh, to produce one square foot of the total assembly. We're not talking about pieces now. We're talking about that entire partition wall. Um, and most importantly then, it gives you the subcontractor's material cost. It gives you the subcontractor's labor cost. Uh, and means has the ability of giving you both prevailing wage and open shop, okay? So that's important to know. It gives you a, a subcontractor total. Then it gives you a suggested total overhead and profit by the subcontractor. Now what the, uh, what the general contractor then does is apply a multiplier to that $4.40. And so I give you an example, 10 foot high by 24 foot partition wall, 240 feet, times $4.40 is $1,056 for the subcontractor. The other great thing about means is it is a national index, but it regionalizes by cities. So Waldorf, for instance, uh, has an index of 0.97. So the cost of that wall by a subcontractor through means is $1,024.32. So at that point, and, and you would aggregate all of these, um, and it, you know you would have acoustical ceiling, you would have um, electric lights, it, all of that is in mean. Uh, but then the job order contractor would then apply a multiplier to the final cost. And my true expectation is that uh, in our area, because I'm going to bid this locally and not go nationally with a really big firm, and they're mostly in the metropolitan area, uh, that we're going to be at 1.0 or less. That's my expectation. So I, I, can, I can really get into a whole lot of pro formas, and I will, be, I will say that this, if we go this route, it's going to be very beneficial to 
Mr. Whitten and the repairs and, and smaller projects that he does can be very uh, beneficial to me and I'm gonna be working very closely with him on the uh, pre-qualification and the pricing document. So what are the advantages of job order contracting? I, it's much more comprehensive. Uh, if you look at what's in Maine, we're probably talking at 400,000 construction activities uh, in the database that we can utilize. So literally, we can almost build anything from this. Um, the other advantage is that the owner and contractor are using the same index, so I can verify it. Uh, and we're going to be using the same software. So I, I will be doing a takeoff, or my project manager will be a doing a takeoff. Mr. Whitten and his staff will be doing a takeoff. And then we'll, we'll get the contractors back, and we'll say, well, this is where we agree that we don't agree what's, what's happening here, and we'll, we'll sort all of that out to arrive at the final quantities. And I think, I think the other benefit is uh, these, they tend to build really long uh, term relationships with the contractor, which I think is really essential in, in working uh, in K through 12. Some of the disadvantages, it is going to require some staff training for us. There's no question about it. it, it uh, and the use of the software uh, and, and, and the use of the information, that, that there will be a learning curve. Uh, and I will also say I, I, I do not think that the job order contracting will always be advantageous to us from a price perspective on smaller projects uh, or, or single trade projects. If you think that $4.40 for the subcontractor for drywall, well, if you've got two square feet of drywall, he's not going to charge you $8.80. There's much more involved in that. So I think that's kind of the disadvantage. So we have to be judicious in the way that we... We use this contract. So some of the contract specifics um, I'm, I'm looking at trying to incorporate is that we would be using this at least on my side for both state-funded project, could be using it for QZAB projects. Both of those have prevailing wage rates, so I need a multiplier for the, the wage scale projects. Uh, but there's many local jobs that don't fall under prevailing wage, so I need a multiplier or the use of the open, um, uh, the open shop uh, reference book. So I, I need to sort that out a little bit. But, so th uh, but nevertheless, we really need to have two, two indexes there. Um, even though we've got 400,000 activities, there's always something really unique. Uh, so there have to be provisions for non-priced items, uh, and what I would expect there is a multiplier uh, based on subcontractor's actual cost. <coughs> uh, our intent would be f uh, for one year initial term for this contract, and then two options for one year renewals, giving it a total possibility of three years. Uh, the Navy and others have always uh, have also included provisions for design support. You know, sometimes we don't need a full any uh, process. You know, we may just need a structural engineer to to verify a load or something like that. So, there is provision in means for those costs, and again, those can be applied. And that's one of the things we will be asking the pre-qualification is what so what key uh, uh, consultants will you be using uh, uh, for the design support. And our expectation is that uh, we will not be using, uh, we will only be using this project for, for, for small projects uh, with a maximum up to $500,000. I think beyond that we, we really need to get into a bidding situation. All right, so what's our process and timeline? I want to put the two things together. I want to use the, the multi-step procurement to pre-qualify the potential bidders. Uh, I'm thinking we can, we can make just a single award on this project. Um, and we, the way we would have uh, analyzed it is we would put together a representative project with quantities, uh, and then we would apply the multipliers uh, provided by uh, the contract, or the bidders, I should say. 
So what's the timeline? I, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to get the prequalification package if you're in concurrence with the you know, approach. In November 2015, uh, it's going to take a while to evaluate. Uh, we will do the. We will come before you first for your approval of the prequalification. And so we'll go through. We'll go through the matrix of what was provided, and why we think they failed or didn't fail. Um, um, so we hope to bring that to you, not in December 2016. I again, apologize. <laughs> 2015. Uh, and then we want to give them about a month because it's, it's going to take that much time for the pricing and a recommendation to you in January 2016. We will keep, we have currently a unit price contract for general contractors. We'll probably keep that into effect until we award this contract so we have the coverage. So I believe that was my last, yep. My last slide, so I'll take your question. Smoothly. No question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Depending on the software package that you choose, yeah. will they all be compatible? Like uh, that they can, like, say, I don't know, because um, I looked up, like, the uh, Gordian group software y package. Yeah. So is that compatible with, let's say, with an another one? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why we chose RS mains. And the Gordian group actually owns RS Mains, and that's how they got into this business. <laughs> and so the software is just a bit of different in the way that it calculates. Um, and Mr. Witt and I have talked, I think we need to decide on which software package we want before we get into the pricing, so the contractor can become familiar with it. Uh, it's not a huge amount of money, it's about the, the subscription-based. Uh, and it's renewed um, annually, updated annually. It's about $500. Okay, and will this software package then preclude smaller companies maybe that are not uh, using the software from bidding? Well, they'll have to, they'll have to prove that they're proficient in using uh, an estimating software program or the job order contracting really doesn't work. Right. And, uh, but I will tell you that, again, almost all of them refer to RS means and as a check on their own estimating. Okay. So that should not be a difficulty. Blazer Construction here locally probably is one of the biggest job order contracting group. Uh, they've got contracts at both Andrews and Dahlgren. Uh, Dennis Anderson was one of the first uh, to do job order contracting. I mean, he was, re he was kind of related with another group, but he actually d did it. Um, so uh, the, cr the, the population that we're really looking at is, should be able to, to fulfill the most technical requirements. Okay. And I know this is not specifically on the software and, and uh, but it does relate to the bidding. Um, like I know this was just an example, the Jimson uh, board. Um, what, what process do you use currently and, and if it will remain the same or change to ensure that the, um, the products are not inferior? Because I know that you know, we, they've had problems with the Jimson board coming from China. Yes. So what's yep. there to kind of, that's just kind of on the side, but. No, no, that's it's a great question. Um, when we put together the scope of the project, we will be writing a specification for it as well. And so one, we can make sure that we're specifying a, you know, a, a U.S. Jimson product made in America or something, that's a concern okay. to us. Uh, the, the project managers are still managing the project. Uh, it's, none of that changes. It's still, it's only a process of how you, you know, arrive at, uh, at, the, at the price. Um, and so nothing else changes. Okay. All right, that's all my questions, thank you. Um, so the way I, 
I envision this working is that it's going to tighten up your your procurement procedures and allow you to have a basis for cost of something before it goes out to bid. It's to make sure that what you are expecting the prices to come in at, it, it will come in at that price. Yeah, it's a much more rigorous process. Right. So what I'm interested in is how much, and especially for Mr. Witten, since you have all those CIP projects coming up in the next two years, how much is that going to tighten up the control, you know, how much is that going to tighten up and allow you to more accurately estimate what the costs are going to be on some of those or to ensure that what we budget right. is is in right. the ballpark, so to speak. Do you want me to answer it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's nice hey, to have you both standing there, yeah. though. It's, it's the, nice. the, uh, let me say a couple of things. <laughs> Establishing the budget is really a joint process. Mr. Witten uses RS Main currently. Uh, I have historical data, uh, and Ms. Howe has his historical data, and she has formulas. A lot of these CIPs are, are, are formula-driven, so it's a combination of, of, of all those three. I think, um, um, you know, certainly having the software in-house and getting proficient in it will tighten up the process a little bit. Um, but again, these are not likely to be used for larger scale oh, CIP mm -hmm. projects, okay? These are really the things where you, you need to, you know, something happens or you just need to get out there. And again, that's the advantage of the expediency of a job order contractor. Mm -hmm. You've got the relationship, you've got the mean, you've got the software, you can easily roll into gaining a proposal and, and moving into the work. So I'll say that. Is there anything you want to add? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only thing he didn't touch on is sometimes funds become available from the state or the county. Right. Then they have a very short turnaround time. Right, as we and saw last spring. And right. sometimes uh, LEAs, including us, I would assume, at some point in history, have had to say, we don't want the funds because we can't get it done by time it's required to be done. I mean, if they give you two months and it's, they tell you in July and you have to have it done by September 1 and you're in the middle, of, you already have all these summer projects planned, you can't take on mm -hmm. another bid process and a design yeah. process. This would enable you to do that. Um, that. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I mean, especially with aging school projects, well, we right. may not get notification until May. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be under contract by June. Right. So uh, th this would really apply well to, to those kinds of projects. And, and part of our advertisement will be that we intend to use it for aging school projects and QZAB so we, so we comply with the advertising requirements of the public school construction program. And I, was, I didn't mention it before, but, or maybe I did, um, that these two processes are strongly endorsed by the public school construction program. Yep. Uh, and I, I really want to move away from what we've been doing with the unit price to something that is just letter on with the job order contracting. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I like the regional multiplier too. I mean, you know, just, I think, I think it's just another good tool to make sure that, you know, even though, you know, you, construction costs you, you've got, but then, you know, once you load in the labor and everything else, I, I think that's, it will make it, things more accurate. Not that they weren't before, because I think you've done a great job in, in estimating and coming in with what, you know, with what the budget was and what the bids were, but I think it'll just, as you said, tighten everything up a little bit and make it easier for you to plan projects going forward and to turn them around a, a heck of a lot faster than what right. you might have been doing now. Right. So. All right, thank you very much. My turn. Your turn. Thank you for your presentation. And you, the method you've described is already approved in law by Comar, and it's used by the Maryland School Construction Project. You pre-qualify the bidders, and they must pass all the criteria to submit a bid, and it's not for projects more than 500000 and it is expedient. It's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of effort. And the only challenge you will have is to, to staff training for this. Mm -hmm. That's it. 
other than that, it seems great. Thank you. Uh, how I know you mentioned a couple of construction companies, but um, beyond those two, how familiar are local construction companies and, and the beyond there, the construction companies that we typically have worked with um, with this particular process? Yes. Well, I mean, certainly the company, again, that's going out on email and marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly some of those uh, larger companies that are currently doing job order contracting uh, will have an opportunity to bid this with the local firms as well. So uh, there's a group called um, Sentinel that does a lot of work at Pax River. Um, they're going to have to bid it and pre-qualify according to our standards. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, there are those, those firms out there. Um, um, so I'm not sure, did that answer the question? It did. Okay. Um, how often uh, is the index adjusted for pricing or for cost? In other words, if we go out with this um, and establish certain rates for particular items uh, or, or go through RS means to do so, um, I mean, there have been times where there's been suddenly a jump in the price of steel or, or something else. How, how often do they make those adjustments and what impact would that have on our projects or on going forward with yeah. this? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, construction uh, is very volatile. Mm -hmm. Pricing is very volatile. A lot of it depends on fuel, a lot of it depends on resources, a lot of it depends on so the labor market. Uh, Means essentially updates it every year. Okay. We would not expect the contract, and they're updating the subcontractor's cost. We would not expect, although some do, we would not expect uh, an adjustment in their multiplier. Okay. Um, with respect to using this process as compared to what we've been doing, yep. do you expect a cost savings? Uh, that's hard to say. Okay. I mean, I, I, I really, I mean, when we do the um, kind of representative project for the bid documents, we'll probably take one that we did through the unit price. Um, you know, if we're able to, if we're able to, to capture a WM Davis or Dennis Anderson or a Blazer, I really think the prices are going to be comparable. Okay. Um, they know us. They know what kind of work, you mm -hmm. know, uh, is required in the school system. Um, that's why I was a little hesitant about just jumping on board with a national company. I just don't have. I, I, my right. general sense we'd be paying more. Right. I, I, I will say this though. <clears throat> One of the school systems that um, that is using the Gordian Group National Program, they've used it a little bit, is Calvert County Public School. And they remarked that the prices were comparable. Okay. It did, that didn't say they were higher or, or lower. It just said, well, that's kind of what we expected. So um, and we'll find out. You right. know, if this doesn't work for us, we're not, if we don't think we're getting the best value, uh, you know, we can, we can basically cancel any time. Okay. So. Yeah, because, I, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't advocate for us um, doing a, you know, like a, a local cost adjustment to say if a local company comes in a certain percentage over, we would accept that instead, but I don't want to shut out our local firms oh, I don't, yeah, I, I'm by doing sorry, this I didn't mean to interrupt. I don't think we are <laughs> at all. Um, uh, they're aware that this is the direction that we're thinking about going in and why, and so I, I haven't had any pushback on that at all. Um, with respect to some of the smaller projects that you talked about, would you maintain the unit price contract that we have for those much smaller projects, or will this subsume that or basically supplant that and, and you'll have to come up with another means by which we do our smaller projects. Well, it, our, that contract is good for another year. Okay. So we could continue it for another year. And my mind right now is that we, we keep it in place until we award this. 
uh, and we get some experience with this. Now we can use, I mean, means is really a, an incredible tool. They do have labor rates, which is similar to what we do in our unit prices. We ask for labor, you know, rates for a roofer, whatever, <laughs> HVAC mechanic. Um, and they would be, a, we could just say, you know what, this is a, you know, this is a five hour job. We both agree it's a five hour job. Let's use the labor rate at, you know, whatever that, that multiplier is. Um, so there's a possibility of doing that as well. Um, I, I like the fact that this looks like it's going to be a more transparent, more data driven en enterprise than we've been utilizing. Um, I mean, based on looking back at history of things, you, your pricing for projects has come in really on the mark. So I don't expect a big difference um, from this as compared to what we've been doing. Um, but I also wonder, do you have a specific project in mind going forward with this that you anticipate utilizing soon after January 1? Um, you know, I haven't really considered that at this point. Uh, I think we need to look at the backlog and, I mean, what we've got out there. Um, you know, we're kind of, um, you know, aging schools will be coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't quite defined exactly what that is. Um, QZAB will be coming up. We haven't defined what that is. Um, I mean, Mr. Wynn may have some ideas of some stuff that he probably wants to do right tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm really looking in terms of the timeline that you have put forward yeah. in terms of, of adopting this um, and then the amount of time that you think it's going to take to train staff yeah. to utilize the software. Yeah. Are you looking at a jumping off point of expecting that come May? Um, you'll I'm, be able to utilize this for any projects that you might bid, put out for bid May on, or are you anticipating that it would be utilized as soon as, you know, early spring or something? I, I was really anticipating using it, I mean, getting trained, get, you know, getting the software uh, and utilizing probably later in the spring. But, it, I, you know, this is complicated stuff, and I may not hit that, I may not hit that January deadline. It may be February. It, but, but I need to get it going now. Right. So. It, it does seem as though um, it's going to be a complex endeavor to set it up, that once it is set up and people are comfortable with it, that it will move smoothly after that point. But it does seem that you are um, offering to take on a, a significant project um, to accomplish this. Um, I mean, I'm certainly in favor of it, but I, I have to acknowledge that this is a huge amount of work at a time that you're already undertaking a lot. Um, and so, um, I, you know, supportive of it, but would certainly be understanding of that timeline sliding some. Um, and, and I appreciate the comments. And uh, again, this is not going to be just me. It's, Mr. Wooden's going to be heavily involved in it. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have uh, uh, Ms. Mayo review it as well. Uh, and I'm, so I'm assuming you referenced, you know, Mr. Wooden, you're already using RS Main, mm -hmm. right, for doing some estimating and, and perhaps not if directly using the, so the software package, you're using a variance of it? I use RS Means as a book. It, it okay, actually comes right. in a book form. Yeah. That's the cheapest way I could purchase it. We yeah. don't use it extensively in the school system. In previous careers, I've worked on jock contracts on the, uh, the general contractor side yeah. of it. Um, so I'm familiar with it from that perspective. As far as contracting it and what we're trying to do, I'm not as familiar with how to put it in place. I know how it should look and I know the downsides and I've used it quite extensively before in a software package. Just when I came here, we didn't have it. Right. So I used the book and yes, that's how we estimate jobs. So if this is to be approved, we would actually be then coming into alignment with where you were before you started here. Yeah, it, it, it makes jobs just quicker to turn around. It really well, right. I, as I look through this whole thing, it's not going to be that we're going to be saving money. It's right. that we're going to be able to go, we want a job, get in the software pack. Here it all is. Here it's all laid out. Here it is. We all agree back and forth moving forward, whereas before, you know, we, we had to it, much it, it, I mean, you'd have to do a study on it for the first couple of years you use it. But where I would, what I've seen, what I've seen, I think others have seen, is you, you save money on your internal overhead right. and your contractor's overhead. because. 
he's not waiting six months or holding contractors or subcontractors out there for six or eight months before right. a job gets started because it still costs money to do that work sure so so as I understood it um, mr. Hartwick you're talking about a um, if we were to go forward th with this we'd be looking at a, a basically a yearly subscription of about five hundred dollars for the software program yeah okay yep pre-approval yeah. of, of contractors true okay. right okay mm -hmm. all right that, that's all my questions thank you very much I appreciate it I it helped me to really kind of conceptualize this, this understand it a little bit better does anyone have anything else Nothing. Just thank you, Mr. Hartwick, for yes, again no, edu you. educating all of us on how our facilities are as fantastic as they are, and through the efforts of, of all the staff that work behind. So thank you, sir. Thank Efficiency you. and forward thinking. Efficiency yeah. and forward thinking. How about mm -hmm. that? We need to make a pen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And with that, our next regular board meeting will be on Tuesday, November 10th. 2015, I and I believe that is a, a morning day. meeting. Yep. It's a day meeting. And with that, before we, before oh. you gavel is closed, I, I noticed that there are some folks yeah, in the group, I, and I'm I'm gathering that you may be here observing us for a class. Would that be correct? Would some could could we ask just? Some, yeah, go ahead, run run that back, sure. Let's. If, if oh, just I, it's you know you're as interested in us we're as interested in you we'd like to know who's here and and even if um, you sit in the back we'll find you out it's like church yeah, yeah sure and, and the classroom and tell us what school you're from as well as what you're doing um hi i'm ellen bowserman i'm uh, here from evergreen elementary school i'm a special education teacher there um and all four of us are here for um uh, class uh, we're working on our um, degrees in leadership excellent I'm Melissa Bean. I teach fifth grade at Benjamin Banneker Elementary School. And as Ellen said, we're all here kind of just observing. We're in a class right now on group dynamics. So we're kind of just seeing how the dynamics work here. Hello, I'm Ashley Abel. I work at Margaret Brent Middle School as a special education teacher. And same, here for the leadership program. Hi, I'm Diana Johnson. I'm at Margaret Brent. We are with the Towson program. I'm actually not in the class they're taking. I'm here as a supporter, but um, I am <laughs> in the same program as them. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank all of you. So you're all in, in, some, in some way considering a, uh, a, a, a career down the path of perhaps an administrator, a content supervisor. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Great to have you. Very good. Thank you. Okay. All right. I gavel it. Good. All right. Being adjourned. Thank you.